Committee will come to order. Subcommittee will come to order. I ask unanimous consent the chair be authorized to declare recess during today's hearing without objection. So ordered. Uh, good morning. Um, welcome to today's hearing on innovations and new developments as we build towards a sustainable, carbon free maritime transportation future. If international shipping were its own country, it would rank as the sixth largest polluter on the planet. The conventional heavy fuels used to move massive ocean-going vessels are laden with sulfur oxides, diesel particulate matter, and carbon dioxide. Uh, that's not pleasant stuff, and it can lead to acid rain, harm crops, acidify oceans, and not, incidentally, impact human health. For example, shipping emissions contributed to 1,200 early deaths in the United States last year alone, disproportionately impacting low-income communities of color who live adjacent to ports and maritime terminals. That should not be acceptable. Recognizing these impacts, the International Maritime Organization, or IMO, has committed to reduce total annual greenhouse emissions from international shipping by at least 50% by the year 2050 from 2008 emissions levels. Additionally, just two weeks ago, the IMO's high seas maritime fuel sulfur emissions cap was reduced from 3.5% to 0.5% to protect air quality and human health. Ship owners, operators, refineries, and regulators like the Coast Guard have adapted to meet this new cap by burning cleaner, high-quality, low-sulfur fuels, or by installing scrubbing technologies. The maritime industry has not taken on these restrictions merely for a challenge. They recognize, rather, that decarbonizing our global economy is a necessity and an opportunity. We are borrowing time from the next generation. The time for change is now, and I commend the maritime industry taking these initiatives. Charting its own path to decarbonize the maritime industry, the IMO requires operators to reduce carbon intensity by vessel, by unit of work, and across the industry as a whole. This will require investments in vessel efficiency, alternative fuels, alternative designs, clean shore power, and more. For ships to serve their planned lifetime and to meet the 2050 emissions reduction goal, vessels coming online after 2030 will need to be either zero emission vessel or very low emission vessels to assure that they can operate for their expected commercial life. We should ensure we have the capability to design, build, and operate those vessels here in the United States. Investing in innovative new technologies and clean maritime commerce is just one more opportunity we have to bring the American maritime industry into the 21st century, and one we cannot afford to miss. Indeed, the maritime community has risen to meet the challenge Although I must stress, the U.S. can and should do much, much more. Today we hear from carriers, engineers, and industrial designers about the steps they've taken to reduce emissions, uh, the challenges they've faced along the way, and what comes next along the path to a carbon-free but no less efficient global maritime supply chain. I ask unanimous consent to insert statements from Green Marine, uh, the Ocean Conservancy, Scripps Initiative, uh, excuse me, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and the Coalition for a Safe Environment into the hearing record. Without objection. I'd now like to call on the ranking member, uh, Mr. Gibbs, for any opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chairman Marley, and thank you to the witnesses who are here today. The, Inter the International Maritime uh, Organization administers the Convention on the Prevention of Pollution from Ships and sets targets for the reduction of sulfur emissions, which went into effect at the beginning of this month. I look forward to hearing what industry is doing to reach these targets, which took effect earlier in the North American and European emission control areas. IMO also set targets for significant further reductions in vessel air emissions in 2030, 40% below the 2008, and 2050, 70% below 2008 levels. I am also interested in whether the witnesses believe these targets can be met, and if so, what would the cost be? IMO also sets international standards for various other discharges for, from vessels, including oil, garbage, including plastic, wastewater, and ballast water. Efforts are also underway to require that ships be quieter. I support market-driven solutions to great investment and innovation of new technologies, which will create a more efficient maritime transportation system. Government mandates will only hinder ongoing private sector efforts to innovate and improve environmental sustainability. I think we need to look at, at the impacts of all these regulations on the shipping industry and look to witnesses' comments on the collective impact of these various environmental regulations and the cost and the efficiency of ocean shipping. Thank you, Chairman, for holding this hearing today. I yield back. I uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, I'd now like to welcome uh, the witnesses uh, on our panel. Uh, Mr. Joshua Berger, 
uh, Governor's Maritime Sector Lead for the State of Washington, uh, Mr. John W. Butler, President and Chief Executive Officer of the World Shipping Council, Dr. B. Lee Kleinberg, uh, Director of Environment and Sustainability for MERSC, uh, MERSC Agency USA, Mr. Peter Brin, Technical Solutions Manager North America for AAB Marine and Ports, and Ms. Kathy Metcalf, President and Chief Executive Officer uh, for the Chamber of Shipping of America. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Uh, since your written testimony has been made part of the record, uh, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony uh, to five minutes. Um, Mr. Berger, you may proceed. Thank you, Chairman Maloney, Ranker Member Gibbs, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I proudly work as Governor Jay Inslee's Maritime Sector Lead and serve as Board Chair and Founder of Washington Maritime Blue, a strategic alliance. Yeah, Mr. Berger, it, you'll find that you can bring the box that the microphone is built into towards you. That'll move. There you go. And if you can speak into it, it'll help the members uh, a great deal. Thank you, sir. Sorry Absolutely. for the interruption. Can I start from the beginning for you? Uh, if you if you want, but if you could just bring that microphone right uh, towards you, sir, it'll move as well. Perfect. There Thank you go. You. So I serve as Governor Jay Inslee's Maritime Sector Lead and Board Chair of Washington Maritime Blue. It's a strategic alliance for multi-sector um, stakeholders charged to implement Washington State's strategy for the blue economy. It is a plan to accelerate innovation, investment, and sustainability in the maritime and ocean sectors. I've submitted written testimony that outlines the details of our state's plan and our implementation strategy. And today I'm here to share how coordination and multi-stakeholder partnerships have contributed to our success and national leadership. And ask that Congress consider what role you can play to support both the necessary R&D plus the ecosystems for innovation it will take to achieve national and global targets. The OECD predicts that the maritime and ocean economy will double to $3 trillion by 2030. Other nations in Europe and Asia are investing billions in zero emission maritime solutions and ecosystems of innovation in a coordinated and organized approach. Not only are they drastically reducing emissions and increasing safety, but they are helping to save billions in operational costs. They're creating new markets and driving capital investments and jobs into communities. In the state of Washington, we've decided that this is the course we want to set to do the right thing and stay economically competitive in a global stage. With great commitment from our industry leaders, we are building on our state's diverse and interdependent maritime sector and leveraging the expertise of our research institutions, tech industry, advanced manufacturing, and ocean engineering to drive investment. Add to this a long history of commitment to environmental performance, quality craftsmanship, and best management practices, and couple that with a culture of innovation, investment, and collaboration, and we will create a global hub for solutions and economic growth. As we were wrapping up our strategy last year, it became clear that we needed mechanisms in place to begin implementing on day one. We investigated other world-class maritime regions. What we consistently found was an organized approach to bring together what we call the quadruple helix of innovation clusters. Government, industry, research institutions, and in our case, workforce and community-based organizations all partnering together. The day we released the strategy, we launched Washington Maritime Blue in exactly that vein. In its first year, we have grown to over 75 members from multiple sectors, all invested in Washington's maritime and ocean economy. Often direct competitors are in the room collaborating to grow collective markets through standardization and technology transfer. They're working together. Over the last year, we've completed a capital landscape study for investments. We're supporting the electrification of the Washington State Ferry System through supplier engagement. We have funded an innovation center and are kicking off a Maritime Blue Innovation Accelerator with 11 companies. We're conducting a feasibility study and a triple bottom line decision-making tool for a zero emission pilot boat and facilitating at least two other joint innovation projects to develop zero emission vessels. But despite this incredible leadership our industry stakeholders have taken, they cannot do it alone. If we were to be successful, it would need to take an organized approach and the right strategic investments by Congress to support the millions of existing jobs in the maritime sector and create the next generation of workforce to make that a reality. We are encouraged by the collaborative approach of some key leaders in the Department of Commerce, Energy, NOAA, 
the Navy, Coast Guard, and MARAD, and will continue to work closely with our partners there. However, to maintain momentum and stay competitive, we need Congress to support a national network of maritime and ocean clusters. We cannot foster and enable these ecosystems of innovation in isolation. State and local leaders need assistance and resources to support local companies, to collaborate, and stoke the interest of entrepreneurs and investors to take advantage of that $3 trillion opportunity. You have access to our complete state strategy, and I encourage you to read it through. It works to advance our goals as an industry. Together, we can take advantage of models that are working, continue to gather our resources, and get to work. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Uh, thank the gentleman. Um, before I proceed, I'd just like to welcome a uh, congressman from Pennsylvania to the subcommittee, Mr. Lamb. He's a new member of the committee um, replacing our beloved Elijah Cummings. So um, Congressman Lamb is an extraordinary member of Congress. He has very big shoes to fill, uh, but we welcome you to the committee. We appreciate you being here. Um, Mr. Peller, you may proceed. Chairman Maloney, uh, Ranking Member Gibbs, uh, members of the committee, thank you very much for the invitation to testify today. The subcommittee's focus on decarbonization of shipping is timely. This issue has been under discussion at the International Maritime Organization for a number of years, but the IMO's discussions and actions have become much more focused and urgent in the past two years. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you referenced, in 2018, the IMO adopted an initial greenhouse gas strategy, and it has set numeric goals for reduction of greenhouse gases from international shipping. The first goal is a 40% increase in efficiency by 2030. The second goal is a 50% absolute reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 versus a 2008 baseline. And thereafter, the strategy calls for emissions to be reduced to zero or near zero as soon as possible after 2050. The first goal, the efficiency goal for 2030, can most likely be met by ringing further efficiencies from fossil fuel powered ships. The second goal, the 2050 goal, will requ require that we find new fuels and related technologies to replace fossil fuels. That is where the activities in the title of this hearing come into play, investments and innovation. When we examined the progress being made on research and development to move shipping away from fossil fuels, it became clear that the scope of R&D underway today is insufficient to deliver the results that we need for deep sea vessels. In response to that need to jumpstart R&D, we began work over two years ago on a proposal to the IMO to create an industry-funded global R&D program focused on developing fuels and related technologies that can allow shipping to move away from fossil fuels. That work has resulted in a comprehensive proposal that we and seven other maritime organizations submitted to the IMO last month, and that full proposal has been included with my written testimony. This proposal, if adopted, would create a new body under the IMO that we have called the International Maritime Research and Development Board, or IMRB. Boiled down to its essence, the IMRB would manage a global, targeted R&D grant program funded by a mandatory contribution on each ton of fuel burned. Based on current global marine fuel consumption, this should generate between five and six billion dollars in R&D funding over the next 10 to 12 years. As you will see from my written testimony, uh, we have addressed funding, governance, intellectual property, conflicts of interest, and many other details that have to be gotten right in order to make this proposal work. There are lots of details, but the logic behind why we made this proposal is, is quite simple. First, it's clear that we have to get beyond fossil fuels in order to make the dramatic cuts in greenhouse gases from shipping 
that are necessary to meet the IMO's goals. Second, today we do not have the fuels and related systems that we can install on ocean-going vessels to meet those goals. Third, the current level of R&D work is not likely to deliver the necessary fuels and, and systems in time to meet the IMO's ambitious targets, particularly the 2050 target. And finally, the necessary level of research and development will not simply materialize by itself. So we need to take action now in an organized fashion to make sure that that work gets done. We look forward to working with the United States and other IMO member states to bring the IMRB into existence. Uh, welcome your questions. Thank the gentleman. Um, Dr. Kahnberg, am I saying your name correctly? Dr. Kahnberg, am I, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Kinberg. See, I knew there was a good chance I had that wrong, so forgive me. <laughs> Dr. Kinberg, you may proceed. Thank you. Um, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Ocean shipping has the most energy efficient way to move cargo long distances and has the lowest carbon footprint per unit shipped of any mode of transportation. The ships use very large diesel engines to move those mountains of cargo. Think 80,000 horsepower engines with great big cylinder heads. Um, and that creates greenhouse gases and other pollutants coming out of the exhaust. Shipping generates 2 to 3 percent of all man-made greenhouse gases. Since 2008, Maersk has reduced our greenhouse gas and other emissions by 42 percent per container moved. 42 percent since 2008. And I might mention that your colleague, Congressman Lowenthal, has been with us encouraging and sometimes pushing us um, all the way since about 2006 on this. Now, our customers and other stakeholders are now asking us to do more, to go all the way to zero carbon shipping. And a year ago, we made a commitment to do just that, to achieve zero carbon shipping by 2050. Now, that sounds like a distant and rather fluffy goal, but the lifetime of a vessel is 20 to 25 years. So let's think through this. And we, by the way, operate 700 vessels. So to have a zero emissions for the whole fleet by 2050, that means we have to have the first commercial vessel on the water by 2030, which means that we have to order it by 2028, which means we have to have designed it by 2027, which means we've got the next five to seven years to define what's going to go into that design. This is not a distant goal. This is a major transformation, and we can't do it alone. We're continuing our cutting-edge efficiency work with a goal of 60% reduction by 2030. We're already testing bio-based fuels, batteries, and other technologies, some of them actually on commercial vessels. As we speak, our first net zero carbon shipments are on a ship headed back from Singapore using a renewable, renewable biofuel blend made from used cooking oil. And we're developing new renewable fuels, including one that involves ethanol and lignin from plants and wood. But the biggest challenges ahead are not just on the ships. The land-based industries and infrastructure must be there to supply the fuels and technologies at scale, and we must do it without jeopardizing food production or forests. Economic and policy systems must also adapt to support this transformation. So what we need to make this happen, first focused R&D, which of course Mr. Butler discussed, alignment between national, state, and international goals, and the legal systems that support them. The International Maritime Organization sets the rules for international shipping and has set metrics and goals for vessel emissions. Requirements also need to be clearly written and well enforced and encourage early action but not penalize early actors. And yes, we advocate for strong enforcement and we're doing so globally. We need a level playing field. And we count on enforcement to make that happen. Now let me give a recent example to show the importance of this. A couple of you mentioned the 2020 fuel rule, which reduced sulfur significantly. Now, most of the global fleet has started complying with that, and of course, it just went into effect a couple of weeks ago, but most of us are complying with that using cleaner fuels. 
It's expensive, cleaner fuels. It's going to cost my company $2 billion a year. So it is very expensive. Now, we fully support the goals, and we are complying. But the temptation's probably out there for others. A vessel sailing from Asia to Europe could save close to $750,000 for one ship on one voyage by ignoring the new rule. Companies rely on good enforcement to provide the level playing field necessary for competitiveness and environmental progress. The same strong enforcement concepts will need to be fundamental components of any climate-related programs, too. Ladies and gentlemen, the transformation to low or zero carbon shipping is an energy transformation, not just a vessel modification. Huge changes to both vessel and land-based infrastructures must happen to produce and distribute those new energy sources and policies and laws must adapt to enable that change. Therefore, thank you for this opportunity to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Kinberg. Uh, Mr. Bryn, am I saying your name correctly? Yes, thank you. Thank God. <laughs> you may proceed, sir, thanks. I've gotten, I've gotten a lot of versions, so that you got it, thank you. <laughs> Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, members of the subcommittee, and my fellow panelists, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on this incredibly important topic. ABB has been an electrification and automation leader for over a century, with 147,000 global employees, 24,000 of which are here in the U.S. We are a market leader in power grids, advanced manufacturing, and electric transportation. For example, ABB has deployed over 13,000 electric vehicle fast chargers worldwide. ABB has 60 manufacturing sites in the U.S. with domestic headquarters in North Carolina and global headquarters in Switzerland. One example of ABB's marine technology is aboard the U.S. Coast Guard Great Lakes icebreaker Mackinac, where ABB provided our electric azipod propulsors and the vessel's integrated diesel electric power system. ABB is excited to help lead the maritime industry toward zero emissions as climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time. ABB supports the Paris Agreement to avert the potentially devastating consequences of climate change. As a company with 9,000 technologists set to invest $23 billion in innovation through 2030, ABB urges policymakers to adopt sound and predictable climate policies to encourage innovation. Today, I'd like to cover three main points. The current state of marine technology, the opportunity to lower life cycle costs and emissions, and how the federal government can help speed adoption. Globally, the maritime industry remains dominated by diesel power but the beginnings of a significant shift are underway. For many vessels, the first step is to electrify the propulsion system, meaning the propeller is di directly powered by an electric motor. This arrangement allows for any energy sources to provide the power from diesel or LNG generators to batteries to fuel cells. In the near term, this can help many Jones Act vessels reduce their emissions. Longer term, this makes it far easy to retrofit low carbon technologies as they commercialize. So what zero emission solutions are available today? It is critical to fit the right solution to each vessel's needs. And in the US, there are three primary vessel segments to consider, tugs and towboats, passenger vessels, and ocean-going vessels. Let's begin with ferries, as they've become one of the pioneering vessel types for zero emission battery deployment. This is because they operate a predictable schedule to just a few ports, meaning batteries can be sized with confidence and only limited shoreside charging infrastructure is required. As an example, ABB is proud to be powering the new Made of the Mist tour boats in Niagara Falls, which will become the first new build all electric vessels in the US when they enter service this spring. The battery banks on these 500 horsepower boats will be recharged in seven minutes between each voyage. Much larger will be the Washington State Ferries Fleet, which operates throughout Puget Sound, as this organization has committed itself to an all electric future. But what about tugs, towboats, and ocean going vessels? Well, that too depends on their operating profile. For example, many harbor tugs, inland towboats, and dredgers spend significant time at idle or low load, which is inefficient for the diesel engine. For these vessels, a diesel electric plant with a battery can help optimize engine efficiency while significantly reducing engine hours. Conversely, for vessels that spend most of their time near full power, like a product tanker, container ship, or line haul towboat, the diesel engine already operates quite efficiently, and so installation of a shaft generator and or fuel switching to LNG or biofuels may be more appropriate in the near term. But despite these near-term improvements, to get to zero emissions, new technologies like hydrogen fuel cells must be considered. 
ABB is already working with, a smaller, with smaller commercially available fuel cells and is jointly developing a three megawatt marine fuel cell with Ballard Power Systems for ocean-going vessels. In France, ABB is proud to be powering what will become the world's first fuel cell powered towboat. With that, I'd like to close with a few policy opportunities to support the transition, uh, to the transition of a zero emission marine future. First, green the federal fleet. The U.S. government is a globally leading ship owner, and as such, it can use its buying power to deploy cost-effective advanced technologies for its own vessels. Two, support financing mechanisms and direct funding for private sector zero emission vessels. While the total life cycle cost of an electrified vessel can be lower than a diesel mechanical equivalent, the upfront costs are often higher. This investment can still be a challenge for ship owners, and so financial support for early adopters to help build volume will bring down costs long term for the private sector. Three, invest in research and development. While there are commercially available solutions today for some marine segments, continued technology improvement is needed to serve more challenging vessel applications. I thank you for, again for the opportunity and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Metcalf. Yes, that's perfectly said. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you very much for allowing us to testify here. And this is not my testimony, but I have to also be very proud because I lived in the western suburbs of Philadelphia. I am tracked down here every day. So uh, it's nice to see a friend of mine from Pennsylvania on the dais. Uh, I'm Kathy Metcalf, President and CEO of the Chamber of Shipping of America, uh, representing member companies who are US based that own, operate, or charter a number of different vessel types. When I was first contacted about this hearing, the indication was it would, would be a green shipping hearing. And so over the holidays, I dutifully did some testimony. And then I found out when I received the invitation that it was a little bit more narrow. It was more towards carbon free um, or zero carbon. But then I thought further, and when I noticed my, my good friend John Butler and Lee Kinberg was going to sit and talk about the specifics of the IMO plan, uh, you are smart guys and girls, and you don't need to hear the same thing twice. So I thought it might be helpful, since I am what's sitting between you and lunch, to go up to about a 40,000 foot level and talk about green shipping and sustainable shipping. Because the only environmental issue of importance to the maritime industry is not just greenhouse gases. It's a multiple of many, many issues, and most of them are linked together. It's kind of like a spider web. You pull on one, you might undo another one. So what I've tried to do is, I noticed that Mr. Thoreau once stated, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. I realize that we all have different perceptions of what green shipping or sustainable shipping is. And in the simplest of terms, green shipping is a focus on re reducing the environmental profile of vessels. Sustainable shipping is a much larger, broader issue that involves society, human factors, and, and there's an excellent diagram in my testimony from the European Union on this. The global industry, 90% of our goods are transported by water. It's also the most environmentally friendly mode of transportation. Now, why do I say that? Not because we shouldn't be doing anything, but because we need to be sure that the most environmentally friendly mode of transportation remains and keeps its share. We cannot afford transmodal shifts to less environmentally friendly forms of shipping. So the regulatory framework, a couple of my colleagues have already talked about this. It's critically important that ships engaged in international trade have a set of robust, enforceable regulations at the international level. We are never going to get rid of national and sometimes subnational regulations uh, around the world, but to maximize the efficiency and the environmental benefit of regulation that consistency needs to be maintained at the IMO level. I'm not going to, to waste your time, as I mentioned, 
talking about the path to a carbon-free maritime ministry. Uh, John and Lee and others have, have done that quite well. Uh, but I would say that what exactly what they said, we totally support. The need for R&D is critical. In my testimony, I've included a few summaries of a number of environmental issues. Air emissions, not just greenhouse gases, but the more conventional pollutants that the industry has been working on. Discharges to the water, including ballast water. Uh, thank you for passing VITA. It is really, after I think 12 years on my part, it was a welcome addition to see that we're gonna finally get a set of consistent regulations that govern those discharges. Biofouling, hull husbandry, critical. A clean hull is a happy hull, is a more efficient hull, which means you have better fuel efficiency. Less emissions per ton mile. Marine plastics. This, this is gonna be hot, and we're the hot part is the single-use plastics. We're seeing it already internationally. Two countries in particular have banned the use of single-use plastics. Ship recycling, another important one. And we talked about it before the hearing, protection of marine resources and noise. What I would say in, in closing, Mr. Chairman and members, a Chinese philosopher once said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Nothing could be truer for the global maritime industry at this point in time, but we have to understand that it is a transitional period as we approach 2050. Thank you and happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Metcalf. Uh, and we'll now proceed to the uh, members questioning following the five minute rule. Uh, I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Um, I have the great honor of representing the Hudson Valley of New York, which uh, was named after Henry Hudson, of course, who sailed up the Hudson River in 1609, September 1609, and actually camped um, in a little spot you can see from my backyard called uh, Con Hook, um, about 40 miles up the river, uh, September 14th, 1609. And he, of course, began um, a process of using that river and so much of our water infrastructure uh, to move goods and services and do discovery and create the American economy. And this was all done by wind. And so what's interesting to me is the role that wind power may play in maritime shipping. It's not exactly a new idea, but um, can you comment on the role that wind powered vessels may play in helping us achieve some of the goals we're discussing today? It's for any member of the panel. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, we, ABB does not, I don't believe, directly play in this space currently, but um, there is, there have been, I would I point to two uh, interesting technologies, one of which are sort of kites and, and sail technology. Uh, there are some challenges there that I'm probably not in a position to speak to, but, but there are some technologies there. There's also been, uh, for the first time, we've seen commercial deployment of an idea called a Flettner rotor kind of these tall columns that spin and kind of generate lift and actually help pull the ship along. So uh, it's an interesting technology and, and worth a look at if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Mr. Chairman, just to add to that, um, my expectation is at the end of the day, we will see more contribution from wind power on land to uh, create green processes for future fuels. In other words, if you are producing hydrogen, you need to do it in such a way that you're using uh, carbon-free electricity, right? So my guess is um, at the end of the day, while some of these technologies can, uh, shipboard technologies can contribute to efficiency on the water, the biggest impact from wind is going to be in producing fuels on land that are then carried by vessels. And building off of that, if you could just discuss, um, I'm interested that in your remark, uh, Mr. Butler, but anyone feel free to answer that, that we're gonna, that, that, that there's a technological layer or a incentive layer that's gonna be required to move to zero emissions past the 2050, 50% reduction benchmark you mentioned. Could you elaborate on that? And what kind of, uh, what kind of incentives and assistance is the industry gonna need uh, to make that goal of zero emissions um, attainable in time to do us some good. 
So, I mean, the basic premise is no matter how efficient you make a diesel engine, you're still burning diesel and you're still creating carbon uh, dioxide as a, as a combustion byproduct. So, if we are going to get to zero emissions, we simply have to have a different propulsion mechanism using a different fuel, different technologies, and having a different emissions profile. So the single most important thing that we can do right now is to create, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, and develop for commercial application those new technologies. We don't know what they are right now. There are candidates. We've talked about hydrogen. People have talked about ammonia and, and using hydrogen either as direct burn or in fuel cells. But there are tremendous engineering questions with respect to the production of those fuels, the handling of those fuels, and the safe use of those fuels on board. So, you know, there are lots of discussions going on in various places about how you push people to adopt new technologies carbon pricing and this sort of thing, more regulations. The fact of the matter is, unless that pathway exists, you can flog people all day long, but if they have no place to go, the change won't happen. And that's why we're so focused on the, the research and development piece. And let's talk about the shoreside uh, infrastructure. Uh, what can we do in that regard to make uh, the decarbonization of that, uh, of, of, of uh, the, the import process, um, Come about more quickly. Well, there's a, you know, you have to do things in the proper order before you start talking about investing in shoreside infrastructure. You need to know what fuels and propulsion systems you're trying to support on the ships, right? So, it's all of a piece, but I, I think it would be, you would risk stranding a lot of investment or making the wrong investments if you jump too quickly into picking a particular shoreside infrastructure uh, before you know what the, what the end goal is. So I think a lot of what can be productively done by government is to assist in figuring out what the right order is and supporting at each phase of that process, you know, the thing that has to happen next before you can get to the next phase. Uh, Ms. McCaff, and uh, my time has expired. I'll yield to Mr. Gibbs, but if you want to say a word on that, Ms. McCaff. I just wanted to add one thing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, there is no doubt that ports and shipping are going to have to work together, and we need to start now. We actually have started talking. John put it well, uh, saying that the order of things is, is the most important. But the one thing, and, and I will cite um, the American Bureau of Shipping Classification Society and DNVGL. Um, Classification Society has done a number of studies. The DNVGL, particularly, I'd recommend it's called the Energy Outlook 2050. And there's a great chapter in there on transitional fuels. So, the key, in my point in intervening here is we don't go from traditional marine fuels now to zero fuels. There are transitional fuels. Fuels such as LNG uh, is a good example that we need to be able to build the infrastructure ashore so that the new LNG-fueled ships are able to use that fuel instead of having to go back to conventional. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I think, Ms. McCaff, you make a good point about the transitional fuels. I want to ask Ms. Kin Dr. Kinver, um, 700 ships, well, I've seen those big container ships. Uh, what's the average age of, in your fleet, is it, and we put a ship on, how, how long do you expect it to be in service? The life expectancy of those ships is 20 to 25 years, but the average age of our fleet is somewhere around the seven-year mark. Okay, so the transition is a huge deal. Oh, yes, it's a big deal. Uh, are you looking at, uh, uh, do you have any of your ships fueled with LNG or not? We do not currently have any ships that are fueled with LNG. Um, a couple of our competitors have one or two. But it is definitely a bridge fuel that um, there does need to be infrastructure for. Just like uh, for biofuels, there will need to be infrastructure. And we think biofuels will be per perhaps another bridge fuel, but are perhaps a long-term fuel. Because with biofuels, you take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to grow the plants. Then you make that into fuel and you burn it immediately. So there's no new carbon dioxide. 
Whereas if you take it out of the ground as a petrochemical, you're actually adding new carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So yeah. there is a difference, and biofuels will absolutely be part of this blend, but we have to do that intelligently, too. Because LNG also, I believe, uh, when it comes to particulate matter, zero emissions on oxide, sulfur oxide and nitrous oxide, it's about close to 100 percent reduction in emissions, and probably, what, 40 percent in greenhouse gases reduction? I don't know the, that number off the top of my head. Uh, Mr. Berger, uh, I understand that the governor of Washington has come out in opposition to building a new LNG f fueling facility in Tacoma. Uh, and, um, you know, when we talk about transition, uh, is the governor of Washington state more inclined to just wait till new technology comes several, you know, three, maybe two, three, four decades away and not, and not uh, uh, look at a transition fuel like LNG? Thank you, ranking, uh, ranking member. So I understand that many in the sector are investing in LNG and infrastructure um, to meet immediate timelines, particularly in IMO and, and ECO regulations. And Washington State Governor Inslee wants to focus on zero emission solutions. Um, my role is to be a liaison and facilitator. Washington Maritime Blue is a kind of member-based organization that's set up to support each of its member goals. The commitment it makes is to be a convener around some of those difficult questions um, in a thoughtful dialogue. Another, another example like that is automation. These are tough questions that we need to have as we make major transitions across the industry. And as a cluster, if we're able to bring together all those multiple stakeholders to work on a common vision and how we get to sustainability, how we get to zero emission, we need to figure out ways to, to address those difficult questions. And as a cluster organization, we're able to fil facilitate that. Um, as long as we're making decisions that are based on science and seek to balance those three prongs that we're helping to grow our maritime sector, we're making healthy decisions for our ocean and marine ecosystems, and, and then also, we're also working on quite looking at those decisions. Communities. If you factor in the economics, because we don't want to put our our uh, companies, our our shippers, uh, in a, a very disadvantaged, uh, you know, competitive uh, position compared to the competitors elsewhere, uh, is that a factor? Yeah, the, keeping a viable, economically viable, and forward-thinking innovation sector is, is yeah. absolutely a factor. Mr. Uh, Ron, at ABB, I think I got that, ABB, not UBS, ABB, right? Um, uh, the, the technology for, for batteries, I think in your testimony, I guess in the last several years has just exponentially improved. Um, when you talk about your, your uh, f uh, ships that are ferrying across the uh, waterways, uh, uh, recharging them in seven minutes, and I know you got the uh, working out there in in uh, Washington State. I believe it's Washington State um, uh, with a, a huge uh, megawatt uh, motor. We're, we're recharging like 15 minutes. So we're talking about 15 megawatts, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, have you guys done any research or, or studies? Uh, you know, obviously that would be a zero emission vehicle, a vessel. Okay, but are we just moving one emission from here to there because the generation to, to generate that kind of uh, megawatts? Um, have you have they, has Amy and me looked at that situation? So we're just not moving emissions from here to there and, and not really uh, addressing a, a net reduction. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the question, and it's a very good one. It comes up often. Um, one, one thing I'd like to point to, I'm looking through our written testimony here. Figure 7 shows an example of a study that we've done for a typical ferry, uh, and, it, and it shows the, CO, the estimated CO2 impact of different design decisions. Um, so you're absolutely right. And we, I sort of look at this as, uh, as sort of a, a two-phase process. The first is, does it help with emissions today? And does it help with emissions long term? And what I mean by that is if we're, for example, going for an electric ferry, uh, the immediate impact will be whatever the CO2 and other emissions of the grid are, how does that compare to a diesel engine? And what we find is even in the most conservative case where you're getting all of your power, for example, from coal, the diesel engine does, uh, excuse me, the electric vessel does tend to be lower carbon and lower on a lot of other pollutants than than the, uh, than the diesel equivalent. And it's because the coal plant can do a lot of um, waste heat recovery and after treatment, things like that. So in the short term, the answer is almost always yes. 
Uh, and, and that's, like I said, the most conservative case. If you're getting your water from, uh, power from hydropower or gas or something, it'd be improved. In the long term, I think that we also have to recognize that the grid continues to clean itself up, and so we'd like to get this technology deployed uh, in parallel so that as the grid cleans itself up, we're, we also have a, an electrified... I'm out of time. Just one quick comment. Sure. The, the, the infrastructure of the grid and our base generation capacity to do what you're talking about, because you're talking about taking recharge of a vessel, one vessel, 15 megawatts, I can just see the power plant up there. <laughs> We're going, you know, meltdown, but the challenge is there. Thank you. It, 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 thank you. Yeah, um, it, it is a challenge. We're working with utility partners to make sure that, you know, that, that, that that's feasible. Um, I, I, I should be clear for the Washington State Ferries project, we are not currently selected for that. We're hopeful to be, but that's, that's still not been decided yet. So I, I just want to be clear we're not uh, the partner on that yet, hopefully. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Larson. Thank you. First off, I want to thank the ranking member for his concern about issues in my state. I um, appreciate that. Um, second, uh, Mr. Berger, uh, on the electric ferries, can you, uh, first off, thanks for being out here and testifying. Um, can you, what's the cost of the transition to electric ferries? This is a ret retrofit, not a new build, is that correct? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, so we actually have both going on at the same time. We're both retrofitting what we call our Jumbo Mark IIs, um, starting with uh, the, first, the first vessel, which will be coming out of the water soon. Uh, that's now under contract, as well as uh, a new build construction. So we've, the state legislature has paid for the first of a series of five new build constructions. So it's a retrofit uh, to hybrid electric and then as well as new builds. Um, the new bid vessels, it's, it's about, um, we're looking at about 15 to $20 million more at upfront costs, um, which would be also be inclusive of the shoreside charging mechanisms that are need to be. It's a very similar, almost same design as, as the uh, previous Olympic class vessels, but with new propulsion systems. And then the life cycle, uh, anticipated life cycle cost relative to a new build diesel? Well, when we're looking at the battery technology, we're, we're slating for, uh, and Mr. Bryn might be able to answer this he, um, uh, because he's putting the, the bid together for it, but I think I we're looking at the batteries for, <laughs> for about five to eight years, we're bringing that cost comparison right now. Oh, you are, okay. You know, and then, you know, as we look at um, some of those key challenges and we're talking about particularly kind of uh, this both end approach and making sure that we're paying attention to the entire system, Yes, you know, we need to be looking at that grid at the same time. Um, we are very fortunate in Washington State, makes us a great place to start um, building and proliferating this kind of technology because we have some of the cleanest and, uh, and cheapest power in the United States, and so it's a great place for us to, to build on these vessels to make the ROI come back right in less than 10 years, um, if not sooner. But the attention and the investments that need to be made to kind of build smart grids and have the, the grid capacity to support charging up to 10 megawatts of these vessels is also critical, as well as we look at other technologies like energy storage on shore in order to kind of take care of the peak shaving on the grid. Um, all that is being under consideration and we need to invest in. So uh, in the in testimony from a few of you, have talked about the, uh, um, the relative, relative ease of passenger um, vessel implementation here because you have uh, set sites, you have set schedules and so on. The state, our state has a larger system, but they're smaller county-based systems, specifically Skagit counties, you know, the, the Guimas Island Ferry, they just need one ferry and um, to replace, and they're trying to move forward on getting an electric ferry for that. Is that something the state can so, d does support, or, or do you have ideas about how these smaller systems can fit into a larger maritime blue uh, strategy? You're exactly right, Congressman. You know, so smaller ferries, both in our county system as well as when we're taking into account the growth of a high-speed passenger ferry fleet um, as uh, population growth across Western Washington is so astronomical, there's more and more look at bringing that mosquito fleet back. Um, there are lots of mechanisms in place within the state, um, uh, and we're looking for others as well. We have our clean energy fund. We have, um, uh, we also have the opportunity to bring in some private investment, right? As we start talking about those opportunities for operational savings, it starts to make sense to bring some private investment into some of those projects. Um, of course, each of those ferries look for both that, that kind of hybrid stack of capital. They were looking at opportunities for various different federal funds, state funds, and private dollars. All that's necessary. 
What we're fortunate to do is now have a mechanism in place to help support those type of projects, go out and seek and then receive those various different types of funding into a particular project. And the cluster organization is there to help support that. Thanks. Um, Dr. Kimberg, uh, our, our U.S. Navy has, um, I've, I've, they have a lot of ships, but they have a few ships that are hi hybrid. And the idea is that, um, that when they're underway, they can switch to a, a, an electric drive. So, because they're just going in a straight line, they don't really need to be doing anything much else. But when they're in, in, out of port and, and into port, they need to have a little more um, maneuverability, a little more control, and so on. Uh, so I'm wondering if uh, um, looking at the larger ocean vessel, ocean going vessels, if that's an option, or are we looking looking at one propulsion system, one kind of propulsion system, or a, or a hybrid system for the 2030 or even the 2050 timeframe? No, I'm not really familiar with what the U.S. Navy might define as a hybrid. Sure. All right. Well, answer my question then. What are you looking at? <laughs> what are we looking at? We're certainly looking at batteries, we're looking at new fuels, but we've also added waste heat recovery. We've changed out propellers to be much more um, energy efficient. We've uh, changed out bulbous bows. We actually give the vessels a nose job. You cut off yeah. that bulbous bow and, and weld on a new one so that it's more energy efficient at today's speeds. And then, of course, you've all heard of slow steaming. And then we've got new, larger, more energy efficient vessels per container. So those are all different approaches that we've taken to try to push this forward and achieve that 42% reduction that we've achieved so far. Now we're going into um, new technologies, uh, what we call the connected vessel strategy, so that Big Brother actually is watching all of those ships and monitoring all of the different engineering sensors and making sure that we are squeezing that last bit of energy out of what's on the vessel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Weber. Thank you, Chairman. Um, gosh, I hope we get the second round. <laughs> I've got three pages of questions. Uh, Mr. Butler, you talked in your comments about 2030 goal, 2050 goal, and, and going forward. And, and has there been any thought to nuclear given and just powering these ships that would be nuclear? Well, that's been a debate, sir, that's been going on for years. Um, my personal take on that is that the politics of that are going to prevent it from ever being a widespread uh, solution for the Hasn't prevented fleet. it thus far, has it? Well, for the that, commercial that's fleet. A that's a joke, Mr. Butler. Of course it has. Thank you. Well, <laughs> let, me, let me move on. So the focus is away from fossil fuels, although I'm hearing Dr. Kimberg talk about, um, was it cooking oil as a substitute? What were you calling that? That fuel is actually pretty limited in uh, availability because it's actually made from used cooking oil in your, uh, that's collected in Europe. Right, right. You want to talk about it needing an a, uh, infrastructure. OMG, you really need infrastructure there to collect all that. Are we really talking about just completely doing away with, is Maersk thinking of just completely doing away with combustion engines? One of the early uh, moves that we'll make will be biofuels, and that's why I mentioned it again earlier. Um, because again, biofuels are considered renewable and that carbon, when you do the carbon accounting, doesn't count because it's taken out of the atmosphere and returned quickly back to the atmosphere. Okay. Um, if you do biofuels, again, you're still back to an infrastructure uh, need, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, how do biofuels compare, for example, to, to um, I'll use LNG, we'll, we'll move off of diesel, hopefully that's our goal here. How do biofuels compare to an LNG-powered vessel? Biofuels is a broad category. There could be bio-LNGs that could be derived from biological sources, but would still need the infrastructure to be delivered to the vessel. Well, if you're talking about liquefied natural gas, now you're talking about storage uh, where you've got tanks that are really, really cold cryogenic storage. Now you're talking about some really, really major. You know, I have five ports in my district on the Gulf Coast of Texas. We do a lot of energy. We export a lot of LNG, so this is extremely important um, that we're talking about it. Um, and I think you also said that an 80,000 horsepower engine uh, was most efficient 
Can you, I'm trying to read my notes here. I'm scribbling quickly. <laughs> hey, what did you say about 80,000 horsepower engines? That was an example. Our engines, unlike some of the military ships, our vessels operate with one great big diesel engine and okay. one big propeller. Some of the biggest ships today do actually have two engines and two propellers, but it, it's, we don't have some of the flexibilities or the costs that the, uh, the military has. Right, well you know that submarines were dual powered where they ran on batteries underwater of course and they would surface and recharge with diesel engines, their batteries. Have you looked at kind of a dual setup like that? Uh, not necessarily diesel, it could be LNG or biofuels or whatever and then batteries. I'll yes ma'am. Yes, thank you. Um, we are looking at batteries. As a matter of fact, we've got a battery being shipped to a vessel right now for onboard testing. But there are also concerns about um, risk assessments in terms of large batteries. How is, does the size of that battery compare to, say, a fuel tank in terms of you're going to use up cargo space, right? If you have too much fuel, too big of a fuel tank or too big of a battery, how does the battery size compare to a fuel tank? Do you know? Well, the, the battery we're going to be testing is the size of a 40-foot container. So it's 40 by 8 by 9 feet. Um, but it's not going to be capable of moving the vessel. It's going to be used for peak shaving. It's going to be used for what? Um, taking off the peak when, when we need to generate more power than the main engine is, is normally generating. So we might have to start up an auxiliary generator. Okay. We would use the battery instead. You mean for like living quarters or operation of the um, ship? A lot of our energy is used for pumps and valves, but it's also used for refrigerated containers because there's a tremendous amount oh, of sure. refrigerated goods moved. So that's interesting because uh, you, you could take a couple of 40 foot eight by eight containers and have pretty good energy supply there. And, and you're gonna see if the battery lasts, is that what your tech, because you know what the footprint is. Are you looking for how, how powerful it is? What are you looking at? Well, the, again, the battery that we're going to be testing is not even capable of operating a vessel at, alongside at shore for multiple days. Yeah, but, it's, how, it's but how, about it, how about the refrigerated units? How about vessel, you know, lights and comfort? Will it do that? I'm not talking about powering the ship, but I'm just talking about running the living quarters, for example. It could run part of them. Okay. Lots of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Um, now to the newest member of the subcommittee who enjoys his own fan club among the witnesses, gentlemen from Pennsylvania, Mr. Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Um, I would like to shift the discussion a little bit toward um, vessels on our inland waterways. Uh, Western Pennsylvania, where I live and represent, has one of the largest uh, inland ports in our country in, in Pittsburgh, uh, with a lot of boats, mostly, uh, tugs and barges on our three rivers. And um, we were the beneficiaries of a, a very interesting government initiative a couple of years ago uh, in which the U.S. Maritime Administration made a $730,000 grant um, to the Pittsburgh region Clean Cities, which was covered about half the cost of um, retrofitting a single uh, towboat to go from diesel to natural gas diesel combination. So it was about a $1.4 million project, uh, single boat, dual fuel system, decreased diesel by about 60% overall. Um, and they've been monitoring ever since how it's been working, but this is a boat that I think was built back in the 1940s. So it was a pretty old vessel that they were retrofitting to do more work with. So. I think it sounds like a great idea. Um, I'm happy we did it to demonstrate that it could work. And I guess my question to the group is, hearing that, is that a good um, use of government investment dollars at that price to be retrofitting these old vessels? Um, what are some other options in that category, particularly as it relates to LNG? Because I, I share um, some of my colleagues on the other side's interest in using LNG more, especially what we produce in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, and I do think it could be what Ms. Metcalf called a transition fuel here. Um, but obviously it's all about price, retrofitting versus uh, designing new engines that would require LNG as well. So I know that's kind of a lot in there, but, but any thoughts folks have on that? I look like Mr. Brennan and Ms. Metcalf both, so maybe we could start on the end uh, with the sole member of my fan club there and then move over. So I, I promise we'll promote it. We'll get you some more members. Um, 
my opinion, and we do have some tug barge members, the American Waterways Operators has a primary inland uh, coverage. Generally what we find in large and small vessels, you're gonna incorporate new technology, it's cheaper to do it at new construction. Retrofitting, I, mean, I think it's great they did this project, but retrofitting a 40 year old vessel just doesn't make a whole lot of financial sense to me other than to see if it can be done. Now keep in mind also, vessels on the Great Lakes are not at that 20 to 25 year lifespan. They're, there's some of them up there are 50, 70 years old, I believe. Okay, well, I'm old too, but I don't wanna to get too old. So it's a different marketplace up there as well. The other thing about alternative fuels on the Great Lakes or electricity is you've got shorter runs. You don't have 5,000 miles of Pacific Ocean that you're having to transit. You've got stops in between that you may be able to integrate a shore-based infrastructure of fuels and or electricity that would be alternatives. Thank you, Mr. Brin. Thank you for the qu uh, question, Congressman. Yeah, th this is a, a topic that's sort of near and dear to our hearts. We've been working with the inland industry uh, and the inland towboats, it's a very interesting industry and towboats come in all flavors and sizes. For example, there are what we call unit towboats that might run from a refinery in Congressman Weber's district and drop off some wax barges up in your area. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting system. You have unit towboats, there are line haul towboats which push 40, 50 barges at a time on kind of a regular liner service. There are shuttle boats that run up across the river. My point is that depending on the vessel's profile and, and need and its service, uh, the, the best solution can vary quite a bit. And so what we found with a lot of boats is what's common, if you take line haul boats out of it and look at the rest of the types of boats, a lot of them do a lot of time actually sitting around. Um, if it's a shuttle boat, they'll be sitting alongside a barge for hours, days on end sometimes. Uh, when you get up into the locking river where, where, where you all are, um, it'll be spending a lot of time going through the locks. And anyway, at that low power, oftentimes these engines need to still idle because the crew still needs instant power if, uh, you know, in, in the event of an emergency or something. And so, um, so what we found is a diesel electric arrangement, while not zero emissions, can reduce engine running hours quite a bit. And, and then if you add a battery, you can also just shut the engines off altogether, run off battery for a few hours, it can save quite a bit of fuel, and, uh, and it's, you know, it's just a nicer environment for the folks on board as well. So there are solutions. The key is fitting the right solution to the vessel, and that can work with LNG or diesel fuel. Yeah, I guess what I'm asking is, um, you know, in, in, within the government, we always, oh, and I'm, I'm basically out of time, so uh, I'll save that thought for next time and yield back to the chairman. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, thank the gentleman, Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all members of the panels. You know, I represent uh, one of the largest port complexes in North America, well, the, the largest in North America, in Long Beach, LA. Um, so I, I'm interested in something that we started a number of years ago, or in California started, and that's, I'm gonna first ask Mr. Byrne, and that goes to your, in your recommendations about solving the shore charging. And, and talking about shore charging. I, I think that the rollout of shore charging and shoreside power systems is vital to be moving in this direction. Uh, for example, in my community, as I mentioned, the LA Long Beach, we've driven substantial reductions in localized diesel emissions, and we're an area that's out of compliance. So this was critically important, not only to move the industry, but to protect our communities, which, are, which we have this tremendous movement of goods in an, in an area that's very hot, very densely populated, uh, and ecologically tends to capture this pollution and let it sit unless we really try to prevent it. So uh, we've driven substantial reductions in localized diesel emissions through investment in dockside power and a state mandate for commercial vessels to use shore power. But we know that the adoption of this technology has been lagging across the country. And an EPA analysis in 2017 that found that outside of California, only a handful of ports have any shore power capacity. 
And you talked about also, Mr. Byrne, about possible grants. And I know if Congress made additional federal grants or loan funds available to install shore power infrastructure, do you believe there's an interest at ports and terminals to adopt this technology without a mandate? And I want each, you know, you can start, you. Mr. Byrne, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Kinberg. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. Um, the, the Clean Air Action Plan in, in California was certainly a, a, a model, and it was it was forward thinking for sure, uh, and it's led to led to a lot of the development. Um, we should be clear about shore charging. First of all, there's a few a few flavors. One is to plug in vessels uh, like Maersk's when they arrive at, at the terminal to power the onboard load while they're in at port. The other flavor is to charge up like a, a battery uh, bank on a ferry mm -hmm. or, or a tug uh, in, between, in between voyages. Um, both have their own challenges. I'd say on the side, which I think you're more referring to, which is charging in ocean-going vessels, mm -hmm. there are opportunities there. Uh, one of the challenges, I, I guess I'd say two challenges generally. One is that many vessels, especially older vessels, are not outfit with the equipment. So, you know, that, that needs to be an upgrade that, done on board. The second challenge is that not all vessels are let's say, obviously suited to it. So, for example, um, a container ship or a cruise ship is a perfect example. A uh, cruise ship has an electrified power system. Container ship, uh, most of the loads that are happening on board are electric in nature, whether it's running the reefer boxes or the onboard mm -hmm. loads, pumps, things like that. Uh, a bulker, though, doesn't have a lot of load when it's in port. A, a crude oil tanker runs a steam pump to out offload its cargo. So m my point, again, just like before, is it depends. Um, and so th finding the right solution for the right vessel can be a challenge. That but may you be could duplicate yeah. this on, not everywhere, but certainly in certain pla certain ports, it could be more widespread. It, it's, it certainly could be, but it, we would have to, as an industry, look at uh, making sure that uh, there is standardization already, making sure that's there, and making sure you know that all new vessels are outfitted. Well, then the I want to go to Dr. Kinberg uh, in uh, asking: Is the industry ready to convert to shore power? In your testimony, you did mention that Maersk uses cold ironing in California. Uh, could your fleet use shore power if the infrastructure is put in place across the country? We're actually connecting today in China. Pardon? China has been adding infrastructure very rapidly. As you know, they have very serious... On shore power, problems. too. So the United so the States... the vessels calling California are also now connecting in China. What about other ports in the United States? Would the you barrier, be able to connect to shore we, power? We don't have many vessels calling the East Coast that actually have full shore power capability. Only about 5 to 8 percent of the global container fleet is currently fully equipped for shore power. It's about a million dollars per vessel to equip it for shore power, and then per berth you could be talking anywhere from one to five million dollars, plus the infrastructure to bring the power to the port. And as you know, California bit the bullet and has made those big investments. Right. California places, wants to protect its residents and the community, and so it made those investments. Right. But other places have, have looked at that and, and then decided perhaps they could get their reductions in other ways that were more cost effective. But of course, California had already been through clean trucks and those things. Do you think it's good to be moving towards more shore power throughout the country? I think it is, but I think we have to find ways to do it more flexibly. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to uh, proceed to a second round of uh, questions with the witnesses' indulgence. Uh, before we do that, um, just a point of personal privilege, I wanted to thank uh, the person sitting next to me, whose name is Rennie Myers, who has been here with the committee on a one-year fellowship, um, Noah's Sea Grant Fellowship, uh, and has done great work for the committee. She's sitting in this chair today, normally occupied. Uh, by the gentleman behind her um, in recognition of her great work for the committee and her extraordinary skill, especially many areas, but especially on areas of environmental concern. Um, so she's going to be going to the National Science Foundation, right, where you will continue to, uh, can't say that? No? Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> strike that. Um, she'll be going to another important position where she'll continue to support the, the committee. So we thank, uh, we thank Rennie for her work. Um, uh, proceeding to the second round, can you, Doctor, uh, if we could just finish up on on some of the questions that my colleague from California was asking you. The, um, I'm interested in the investments the Chinese are making uh, that you alluded to. And if you, could, if you could describe why that would be important to the Communist Chinese Party to make those investments. China has a very serious air quality problem. And so they have um, been looking at 
best practices around the world and imitating some of those. So as we began to fuel switch here, and you were there when we first started doing that, they made that voluntary and then mandatory to use cleaner fuel in ports. Um, and that's a very good way to reduce the sulfur that, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, does have health effects. Um, they also are uh, having the vessels connect to shore power and then you turn off the engines so there's no engine exhaust. And that way it reduces the air emissions, the toxic air emissions that are created while you're alongside. And what kind of investments are we talking about by the Chinese government in that regard? I don't know what the total is, but I know that there are about 12 or 14 ports that have very quickly installed shore power capability on lots of, lots of berths. And is that going to merely serve an environmental purpose um, in China, or will there be international economic opportunities for that technology, for those, that type of equipment and shoreside infrastructure that the Chinese can then export? I believe a lot of us are actually using Italian-made, um, although they may be produced in China, but in terms of the plugs and so forth. And in terms of the U.S. industry in that regard? I'm not aware of any U.S. industry that's doing that. Right. In, in, in other words, um, I'm interested in the types of investments. When we talk about, in response to Mr. Weber's questioning about batteries and the, and the critical role they can play and the size and the safety issues, um, is it fair to say you depend on um, or what, what role could robust federal investments in battery technology play in assisting you in that, in that effort? Or how much of that currently is being borne by the private sector? In other words, that's a generic, that's a generic technology to Mr. Brin's point about uh, making the technology fit the mission or the vessel. But there are some, there are some basic core uh, technologies involving uh, an enormous need for research and, and development it, it help us understand what role the federal government could play in assisting the private industry in moving that to market in a cost-effective way. There are tremendous opportunities, but tremendous challenges in terms of coming up with energy storage. And it's not just the maritime industry, it's our entire economy. That's a game changer if we could come up with, with cost-effective ways to store energy and not just have to take it as it's made. So. Battery technologies would be a game changer, not just for the maritime industry, but I think our whole economy. But from your perspective, is the private sector going to be able to get there on its own, or do we have a role to play? I think I'd have to turn to those sure. who know better than Mr. I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so looking at, battery, looking at marine battery technology specifically, um, if you look at the cost structure for some of our marine battery manufacturers, when I, when I talk with them, they say that the cost of the cells, which is the fundamental building block of the battery banks, is on the order of about 20 to 30 percent of the overall cost. And the remaining 70 percent is, is specific to a marine-built battery. With And obviously, safety is always paramount, and we have a very high standard in the maritime industry. So that is to say that um, I would say that about 20 to 30 percent of the cost is going to benefit from the global trend of, of high battery volume production. So that cell cost will come down. Uh, just following global trends. The remaining 70 or so percent, that's up to maritime to, to get that cost down. And that is going to be a challenge because it's a low, it's generally a low volume industry. So I think that's where we can help some of our marine battery manufacturers out. And I'm happy and proud to say that despite the fact that Europe is leading on, on actually deploying a lot of these battery technologies, we actually have a lot of manufacturers right here in the U.S. that are actually supplying some of those, uh, two in the U.S. and one in Canada that's some of the global leaders on marine battery systems. On a different subject, um, uh, would the panel comment on the role the Coast Guard plays in the international enforcement of some of the issues we've been talking about, was touched on in some of the testimony. Uh, what is the most effective international enforcement mechanism? And can you talk on the role the United States Coast Guard will play? Mr. Chairman, the, the, the entire international enforcement um, regime basically has two prongs. It's flag state control and it's port state control. And the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, the primary role when we talk about enforcing these environmental laws is with respect to international ships, it's primarily a port state control operation. So it's a question of having the Coast Guard have the necessary staff and the necessary tools um, to efficiently inspect vessels to make sure that they are complying with these various regulations. And as Dr. Kinberg said earlier, 
Uh, it may sound a little strange for uh, industry to be calling for more enforcement, but the issue of having a level playing field and making sure that we're not distorting commerce here is quite critical. I'd say the other key role that the Coast Guard is playing there in terms of inspections is working closely with industry as we're commercializing new technology. So other maritime authorities around the globe have clear standards, let's say for battery technology in particular, where the United States Coast Guard is, is working hard and working closely on a case-by-case -case basis for all battery-operated systems. We do not have a clear CFR within the Code of Federal Regulations on battery technology and battery systems on board vessels. And so the role that they can play, and I know they're working hard to do that and they're in support, but on, at this point, they're still working on a case-by-case -case basis versus having a clear, clear regulation in place to support that. And what that does is help industry then make investments as they're commercializing new technology and, and, and that is working their way up into the fleet. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Gibbs. Thank you. Um, I know uh, Mr. Butler talked about the IMO making the uh, making it by 2050 is probably unlikely, the IMO uh, requirements, but I, I want to pursue this a little bit about the technology with uh, Dr. Ginberg. What's, uh, what's the horsepower requirements to move these container ships, these, your big ships? Again, it depends on the size of the vessel, but when we talk a small vessel, we're talking something that's one and a half football fields long, yeah. and when we talk big, we're talking four football fields long. So these, these are big ships. What kind of horsepower is those engines? Um, and the, the biggest ones might run two engines that are 55,000 horsepower. Are those uh, direct mechanical? They're not, they're, they're not running motors. It's a run the propulsion system. It's mechanical, right? Or it's, it's one big propeller or two big propellers. Uh, so it's a mechanical off the off Yeah, the and you've engine. got a main so shaft. Go to Mr. Byrne. Uh, we're talking batteries, talking um, uh, to make that kind of uh, energy equivalent. You know, what kind of the battery technology? Are, I know we've made big strides in the last few years in battery technology, but are we anywhere close to, have, to having that kind of technology to to to, to have battery technology to, to propel uh, through electric motors? And that would help the quieter issue too. Is another issue. Where are we in that? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, we, th the short answer is, is no, and, and I wouldn't expect batteries to ultimately be the solution for ocean-going vessels. Um, I think batteries may play a role. They'll continue to improve on space and weight and cost, which are the three main factors that we have to consider. Uh, I don't think long-term we ever expect batteries to have sufficient energy density for a container ship. Where ABB would likely expect uh, one potential candidate are, as I mentioned before, fuel cells, and that's because you get much greater energy density in hydrogen fuel than, than you do in batteries. Um, so, but batteries may have a role to play even with fuel cell systems because they can handle transient loads much better. So if you have an instant ramp up or ramp down of power, the battery can help to keep the fuel cell on a steady output. Um, but fuel cells are one of several solutions being considered, and that's certainly one that we're focused on. Is, is, uh, Dr. Kinberg, is, is MERS looking at fuel cell technology or not? We're looking at it. We're not currently using it commercially. Okay, I hear back. Thank you. Ms. Larson. Thank you. Um, Mr. Berger, on the maritime blue strategy that, you have, that we have in the state, can you comment, based on your, on your experience as a merchant mariner, um, uh, as well as working in maritime beyond that, can you comment on what you are planning to do with regards to workforce development to support these changes? It seems that uh, sometimes we can flip a switch on the economy and move on, but this is new technology, new research and development that re seems to require maybe not all new skills, but some new thinking on how we develop that workforce for us. So what's, what is the state doing to prepare for that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Congressman. It's another area where I'm a firm believer in that yes and approach. And as we're looking at new technology, we're focused on innovation and we're focused on that investment. Exactly to your point, we need to be focusing on what the next generation of the maritime workforce looks like and how we approach that. Um, this, is a, this is a topic worldwide. In Washington State, the average age working in the industry right now is 54 years old. We call it the silver tsunami. 
Um, the average. Um, uh, Just a uh, minute. I'm I'm 54 years old. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a role for you on board a vessel. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there is. Yeah. The majority. The majority of. Uh, I can captains. pull. I can pour a mean bowl of cereal. So, yeah. <laughs> likewise. Likewise. Majority vessel captains and chief engineers in our state ferry systems are ready for retirement within the next five years. The majority of them. Um, we also uh, have issues around gender equality and underrepresentation uh, under of youth of color that are looking at the maritime industry as opportunities. That's particular issues in Washington State. Um, so those are something. Those are things that we're particularly focused on. Washington Maritime Blue, as a cluster organization, is. Uh, we're working. We've developed a program called the Youth Maritime Collaborative and trying to create specific uh, workforce pipelines and pathways that go right into what we call career-connected internships and apprenticeships. It's a big focus in our state of Washington's uh, workforce development planning. Uh, so we're, we're, we're paying particular attention both to making sure that we're providing pathways or just the outreach and awareness, uh, particularly to underrepresented communities, uh, as well as a focus on the new technologies. Um, we've, we've done a lot within the state to uh, invest, particularly in our trades-based programs, but much like all of, the, all of the focus, there has been parts and pieces from the, from the federal perspective and focus on both workforce development as well as in innovation, where we do not yet have a coordinated approach. There is not one agency that's focused on maritime or that's focused on maritime workforce. And so without kind of a concerted effort, without some sort of coordinated approach, we're not able to really um, make the best use of those dollars uh, or focus those dollars to where investments are going to make the most sense. I know that the state has signed an MOU with uh, Nor the Norwegians. Um, I'm not sure which, which, in which agency in Norway have you all signed with? That MOU is between the Washington State Department of Commerce and Innovation Norway, which is part of their Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Fisheries. Okay. Um, so w within the MOU, this now moving back to the technology side of things, within the, uh, the MOU, um, trying to figure out how how best to kickstart the challenge the shipping industry has with regards to getting ships that have to be ready in 2030 for, or 2050 and what role that collaboration plays in developing which technologies that can support shipping to meet those goals in 2050. Right, and, and even sooner, as Dr. Kinberg was saying, yeah. Um, uh, that, that's on multiple fronts. A big part of the relationship between Washington State and Norway has been focused on electrification of ferries, being that Norway is a global leader in that work. And so the opportunities for technology and knowledge transfer has been um, remarkable, as well as, uh, as, well as some cross-investments. We've also found um, great uh, relationships between the different research universities and research labs. So we're setting up meetings now between folks in our Department of Energy and the Pacific National, um, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and the NTNU that's up in Trondheim in Norway uh, that are you know, diving deep into what these potential new fuel source solutions might look like, whether they're hydrogen or ammonia or likewise. So you know, coupled with uh, Norway's expertise on um, battery technology on ferries, and research institutions that we have, I, th I think, coupled expertise with. Uh, that's where, that in, in line, I think, focuses on where our MOU is between Washington State. And it's about cluster to cluster relationships. So they have a built out uh, system that supports these innovation clusters across Norway. Again, this is a public private relationship where you have competitors working together to create new markets and create new technologies. Um, and that with support from government and support from research institutions. And we have found that that has been the best way to move forward actual commercialized projects that, go, um, that, that are on the water. The first all-electric ferry, Ampere, came out of a joint innovation project out of a cluster organization. The first hydrogen ferry that's being built in Norway is coming out of a joint innovation project within their cluster organization. These are federally funded or nationally funded programs, uh, some of those dollars come from the European Union as well, coupled with private investment in R&D and their research institutions. And so, yes, we have 
you know, in, uh, business to business relationships with them as we build out projects. We're also learning from one another on how we develop these types of joint innovation projects where we're coupling national, federal dollars with private investment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is, it do, is it Dr. Kindberg or Kinberg? I missed what you said. It's Kinberg, like Kinberg. kindergarten. Uh, like kindergarten? Okay. Thank you. Um, so you said early on, well, let me, let me back into it this way. So the American Association of Port Authorities, uh, which is, consists of Canada, the Caribbean, Latin America, the United States, um, I looked at their website real quick just for the benefit of the panel and for our group up here. And under their issues, they really don't talk about, about, talk about any of this. So there's, we're having a discussion about having ports build facilities, infrastructure to charge huge batteries on board on ships and shore power, we're calling it. Um, as I said, I've got five ports in my district, more than any other member of Congress, and uh, actually ran a uh, transportation company for a short time, which delivered to ships at, on the port of Galveston. So I've got some firsthand experience in that. Anytime you ask a port to build, a, a, whether it's an electrical plant, call it whatever you want to, a system of building out, you're gonna be taking, to power ships, you're gonna be taking very, very, very valuable real estate uh, to build an energy plant, for example. That's gonna take away from some of the local economy because a lot of these, a lot of these uh, harbors and these shores and sides and stuff, the docks, uh, are used to supply these ocean-going vessels. In the Gulf of Mexico, you can go across down into Galveston and look during the night, and you can just count all the lights lined out about 40 miles out, 30, 40 miles out, because waiting to get in the Houston Ship Channel. If you use that area for electrification, if you will, powering a ship, you're taking up a very valuable berth or docking area that the ports might not be willing to give up, at least at a very low cost. Are you with me? If you look at the American Association of Port Authorities website, they have a list of issues, and none of this is being discussed in their issues that I see. So it might behoove us, Mr. Chairman, to bring them in here into the next discussion and to say, what say y'all about the prospect and possibility of being able to build out this infrastructure so that we can service these, on, these ocean going vehicles? I hope that makes sense because this is a group that uh, really will have a vested interest in it. Now, Dr. Kinberg, you said early on that um, there needed to be an agency that could enforce those rules, enforce them fairly, but help something to the effect of you know, not necessarily enforce them early on Kind of as this, is this girl, you want to elaborate on that for a second? Let me clarify just a little bit. There are those of us who are acting early, just like we fuel switched early in California, and it cost us about $20 million. But then when California made it mandatory, we already knew how to do it. Um, And lost track of where I was going. I'm sorry. Well, let me let me let me fill in some blanks here from another part of your conversation while you're thinking. So you said a, a ship coming from China to Europe could save seven hundred fifty thousand dollars on that one trip. How many trips can they make? What is it? Is it one a month? Is it twelve a year? What is it? That trip is maybe twelve weeks. So it's three months. Less. It's, yeah. So. We want somebody that is able to enforce those rules, enforce them fairly, and as the, I think what you're alluding to, as the learning curve is happening, you don't necessarily want an agency to come in here and, and just blast everybody with fines and fees if they're acting in good faith. I think that's what you're alluding to. Well, the, the point that I was making is sometimes you have people who try something new. Right. Say if we tried a battery from Mr. Brenton, and then a rule were put in place that made that battery no longer meet the requirements. Okay. You'd want to grandfather that. Sure. Um, and there are also programs that have been put in place by some ports and other entities 
that have actually provided incentives for going beyond the regulatory requirements. Sure. And those have been very effective in some places. And those are voluntary, by the way, those incentives, yes. and you, uh -huh. you shouldn't be penalized yes. in case you don't want to want to agree with those. Mr. Butler, you look like you wanted to weigh in there for a second. No, I just wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, emphasize the point that Dr. Kinberg made. Uh, there's short-term enforcement, if you will, and then there's the question of policy development in such a way that you create the proper incentives and you, as, as, as Dr. Kinberg said, you don't penalize people that have tried things new and you don't set up situations where you're going to strand investment. You sure. need to think it, think it through. Right. And I've been handed a note, Mr. Chairman, that Ms. Metcalf would like to weigh in. If you can do that quickly, please. I can do it very quickly. Um, robust enforcement is critical. One thing that's not been mentioned yet is the fact that the industry was fully supportive and, in fact, recommended initially that the new uh, amendments to MARPO Annex 6 has a ban on carriage of non-compliant fuel. So it, you don't just have to not use it. After 1 March 2020, you can't have it on board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Just know for the record that the American Association of Port Authorities, uh, to its credit, has a section on its website entitled Environment and Energy, which includes the language as environmental leaders in the maritime environment, seaports employ alternative fuels such as electricity, fuel cells, solar power, wind energy, and LNG. Um, Thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. I scrolled quickly and didn't say that. Thank you. Um, always happy to be helpful. My friend from uh, Texas, Mr. Lomethal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd, I'd like to follow up on uh, the question of hydrogen fuel cells and where we're going with hydrogen fuel cells. Kind of an interesting process is taking place in my port at this moment. Toyota, which has been one of the... Feel free to take that. Yeah, you can have that. One of the leaders in hydrogen fuel cell... Uh, is in the process of trying to develop a, uh, uh, a facility in the port of Long Beach which will generate hydrogen, to create hydrogen. Now, they're going to be using it, I believe. Well, first of all, let me preface that. And our local utility has some issues with that as that develops because of um, uh, the what it's going to take to develop that hydrogen and, and how that fits into our air quality goals. And so this is not an easy thing, but the port is going to go forward with Toyota with a demonstration project. Uh, and that demonstration project is really going to be used for heavy duty trucks and for yard equipment. I think that's the focus of if this, if this hydrogen facility is developed to, in the, to move forward with that. My question is, is there a possibility to use this also, or as, is, could this be a stepping stone to the maritime industry itself to begin to use some of this if we have a plant in the port that actually produces hydrogen? Congressman, uh, we also in Washington State have a couple of demonstration projects yeah. similar to what you're talking about. Um, Tacoma Power, which is a utility in the a city of Tacoma, is also looking at uh, the potential of a demonstration project not only to power, um, like you say, yard equipment, trucks, they also operate a small train mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that moves containers around throughout that yard. Uh, Grant County PUD in central Washington state is also looking at it. Um, Already, um, you know, that, that kind of infrastructure and being able to use those demonstration projects to, uh, to take a look at maritime applications, I think is absolutely critical. And we saw the first passenger ferry, hydrogen powered passenger ferry in San Francisco. It was a partnership that was a private partnership along with technology that came out of the Sandia National Labs. So another uh, opportunity for partnering with, uh, with federal dollars. Um, our Department of Energy and the Water Power Technology Office has focused their energy for wave and tidal and how to develop um, alternative and renewable fuels out at sea and a partnering looking towards um, what the maritime applications are for offshore marine renewable energy. So I think all those projects are going to be absolutely critical as we look at a network of what the next future fuel looks like, certainly for, um, you know, for global and offshore and you know, deep sea 
but also a as well for uh, for nearshore and short sea shipping. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm just wondering and listening to, thank you for that. Uh, I just see that with the limitations of battery that we're really looking at in the future, other alternatives, and I certainly think that this is a potential. I'm glad to hear of these demonstration projects, although they have not really reached out yet in our community to deal with some of the maritime shipping part, but they're yeah. doing, you know, every the all the other equipment that's needed at, in in the port itself is really what they're going to be using it for. But I see this as a step in the right direction, and I'm just wondering if others have any thoughts about that. Ms. Metcalf? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Uh, I'm not an engineer. I was a decky, so I like to see the sun. I'm, I, I'm not technically as proficient as some of my colleagues here. But I did pass organic chemistry, as I know you did. And even though I'm older, I still have to fight to think outside the box. But it just keeps coming back to me what water is. It's salt, sodium chloride, Mm -hmm. It's oxygen, and it's hydrogen. Right. And I think that may be the line that, that you're following. We might have a whole ocean out there of potential hydrogen fuel if we can figure out how to actually do it. I'll leave that up to the certified smart people, though. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal, just one observation about that. Uh, the question you raise, which is a very good one, about how do we use some of these demonstration projects to figure out perhaps where we go next on a bigger That's right. scale is one of the fundamental research and development questions out there because <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion today about um, short sea and ferry applications. Mr. Bren properly pointed out that a lot of the technologies that are available for those applications are not in fact scalable or not likely to be scalable for transoceanic deep sea shipping. So I think as we have this discussion about encouraging investment, about ways in which the, the government can help, uh, private actors can, can move this forward, we have to keep in mind that the scale is different for the transoceanic mm -hmm. international large vessel sector than it is for uh, the short sea sector. And we can't right. make the mistake of simply saying, well, if batteries work for ferries, we just need a bigger battery. That's not necessarily the case. Congressman, on, on your example about the demonstration projects, um, you know, I guess the one thing I wanted to point ba back out as well is, um, as we're working with the National Laboratory Systems and the Department of Energy, as well as Coast Guard and MARAD uh, and NOAA and the Department of Commerce and EDA funding, there are parts and pieces of folks across the federal agencies and enterprise that are having small parts of this discussion separately. Mm -hmm. um, until we kind of have a, a, a focused and organized conversation, I think, across the federal enterprise, it's going to be hard for us to make the right investments into the right vessels, as Congressman Lamb was talking about. It's going to be hard for us to understand the nuances of different vessel types and different appropriate fuel types for different. So until we have that level of organized um, approach and directed funding towards that, it's going to be hard for us to really start to scale and have those, those level of conversations. And I think cluster organizations coupled with your focused approach can really help us make some leap forwards. Well, I thank you very much uh, and thank back. the panel. If there are no further questions, uh, I would just conclude by saying, you know, it's just clear from this conversation and, and one of the reasons behind today's hearing is that Many of us up here do understand that if 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 we are going to ask you to be uh, who we want you to be, we're going to have to be who you need us to be in terms of the the role the the public sector needs to play. And I think that effective um, that effective teamwork between the public and private sector in this area, as in so many, is critical. And so we are very interested in continuing to understand uh, the productive role the Congress can play, the federal government can play and the public sector can play in terms of resolving some of these issues of effective enforcement, uh, giving you the, the basic research and investments necessary to bring these technologies to market in an in a, in a economically efficient way, some of the political issues in, involving shoreside in infrastructure and the, and the trade-offs there. Uh, they are all legitimate concerns and questions, but, uh, but if working together, there's not a reason in the world we can't solve these issues um, and make your energy more successful, more efficient. 
uh, and time to do some good uh, in terms of our in terms of our responsibilities to the climate. So with that, um, seeing uh, no further questions, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for participating in today's hearing. Um, your contribution has been tremendous. And I'd ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as the witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted to them in writing. So ordered. And uh, further unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, if no one has anything else to add, uh, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you.